All right, we're continuing our sermon series on the names of God. You know, in ancient times, names had a little more significance than I think a lot of uh, the way we deal with names today. You know, I, yeah, I hear parents naming their children, and you say, why did you choose that name? And they say, because it sounds good, or I like the nickname. And then you think, did you look up what it means? And sometimes the names mean some weird stuff. But in the old days, especially biblical days, when they named a person, they named them because of the meaning. It had significance, and quite often it was prophetic, so they would name them in hopes that this is what this person would turn out to be, this would be in, in this person's life. And so we're talking about the names of God. Now, God gave these names, they're written in Scripture, and they're not so much prophetic that this is what God would become, they're names to reveal who God is. And the better we get to know His name, the more we get to see what He can do in our lives. Uh, God is, is, is omnipotent, and, and getting to understand him, I think, is an eternal, uh, eternal journey, but we are learning the different character traits of God, and as we study these names, we get to realize that there are significant parts of who God is. So we've already covered a list of names. We're going to be covering today Jehovah Shalom. Uh, this is uh, the Hebrew word Jehovah Shalom, but actually in English it means the Lord is my peace or God is my peace. So you start talking about peace. How many of you would really like to have peace? I mean, really like to have peace. Anybody here like to have peace? Yeah. Why don't you just turn to somebody and say, peace, brother. Peace, sister. Yeah. So you got it. There it is. Wasn't that awesome? No, man, that just doesn't work. I mean, we tried that. It just doesn't work. We're looking for real peace. When it says the Lord is my peace or Jehovah Shalom, uh, this is a little bit deeper. You know, we, we want peace of mind. We, we want peace in our soul. We want peace in our conscience. Uh, how, what, what would you pay to know that you had peace with God? I mean, how, how important is that to you? To, to know with confidence God is not angry with you. How would you like to be able to go to bed at night and close your eyes and be at peace? How would you like to live in a world that was at peace? Wouldn't that be nice? Or how would you like to at least have your own home be a place of peace? No arguing, no fighting. I mean, it's something everybody wants. We all want peace, and for some reason it seems to elude us. But, but when we talk about Jehovah Shalom, I truly believe this touches something deep inside of us. It's a craving we all have. Everybody has this craving. Not just Christians. Everybody has this craving. And I believe that it's like a, it's a God-shaped hole in our heart, and only Jehovah Shalom can fill that need. So that's what we'll be talking about this morning. We're going to start in the book of Judges, but before we do, let's take a minute and honor God's word. If you have your Bibles, let's hold them up. Our verse for December, let's all say this together. Lord, you are God. Your words are trustworthy. You have promised these good things to your servant. 2 Samuel 7, 28. You know, the real sad thing is most people have no idea what good things God has promised. Most people don't. Most people have not even read his word. Less than 25% of Americans have ever read the Bible from cover to cover. Less than one out of four have ever read it. How, how are you going to know what his promises are if you don't know what the word says? And as a result, many Christians live lives where they're depressed or they're oppressed or they're in poverty and they just don't have the revelation that you get when you read the word of God. It comes from reading the word of God. And Satan has convinced so many people, well, you'll never understand it. That is a lie. The Bible was not written for theologians. It was written for you. The average person, it was not written by theologians. How they have stolen this book, I don't understand. It's written for you. It's easy to understand. Don't listen to the lie. I can't understand it. The reason most of us don't understand it is because we don't read it. If you read it and you pray, God, give me understanding, you will understand most of the Bible. You're never going to understand all of it. I like to quote Mark Twain on this. When asked why he was reading the Bible and did he understand it all, he said, no, I don't understand it all, but you know, the stuff I do understand keeps me plenty busy. Okay? You'll understand it. You will understand it. So, 
every year, passion I have as a pastor is encourage you, please join up with our reading program. We have a new one starts in January. We're calling it On Guard. Get your sword ready. Be ready to fight. You can do the New Testament in two years. If this is your first year, you start in the Gospel of Matthew. If this is your second year, you're starting in the book of Acts. It's about two or three chapters a week. Come on, anybody can do this. Even if you skip a few weeks, you sit down for an hour, you can catch up. But, but it'll get you on some kind of reading program. Sign up. Do it with us. I, I've been doing reading programs, uh, you know, 30 plus years. I've read through this book so many times I've lost count. But I continue to read it because I know his promises are there and they're alive and it's still, it's a living book. Do it. Join up with us. And if you do, sign up. I do a blog every Monday or Tuesday. It's on our Facebook, the Vineyard Facebook. It's on my Facebook page. It's on a, the church website. Uh, you can go directly to the blog and just have it sent directly into your email. You can interact with us if you have questions, you want to make comments. But it just kind of keeps you in the loop. So let me encourage you. Join up. Re read the book. Read the book this year. Make it a decision. I will do it. And then after you've done it for so many years, it just becomes part of who you are. But if you've never read it, make sure this year you say, I'm on target. Half of the New Testament this year, another half next year, you'll be making great progress. All right? So we're talking about peace. Have a quick text poll for you. So everybody wants peace. Well, then I have a question. How much peace have we actually had in the last 4,000 years? How many years have there been world peace? 174, 268 365. I mean, what a crazy thing. Everybody wants peace, but if one of these are right, we're talking pretty low numbers out of 4,000 years. 4,000 years. There's been almost constant war. In the 60s and 70s, I marched. I remember marching when I was at college in these peace rallies. You know, we want peace. We were just, at that time, I was young, but I'm thinking, can't we have peace in this world? Can't we stop these ridiculous wars? Why do people have to die and, and call someone their enemy, and then 10, 20, 30 years later, they're our friends and we're trading with them? It just makes no sense. But yet there's war. Look around. I mean, uh, you listen to the news every morning. There is at least two or three wars going on all the time. Somewhere in the Mideast, there's always a war going on. People want peace in their cities. They say there's wars in our cities. People want peace in their countries. And then everybody's trying to figure out how to get peace. You have politicians saying, well, you know, if we just take the guns away from the good law-abiding citizens... And just let criminals have them, we'll have peace. I mean, it's just, it's absurdity. Don't they realize? I mean, what did Cain use when he killed Abel? It was not a gun. It's not the gun or the knife or the baseball bat that makes the person evil. There's something else. We need more if we want peace. What do we have for the correct answer? Wow, man. More voted for 174. Okay. Statistically, according to the Society of International Law... So this is footnoted. Out of London, during the last 4,000 years, we have only had 268 years of peace. So if you do the math, that's about 7%. So that means 93% of human history in the last 4,000 years, there have been wars. 93% of the time. Actually, they've recorded 8,000 peace treaties made during those 4,000 years and broken. They've recorded 14,351 wars, three and a half billion people killed because of war. You're talking about peace. Everybody wants peace. We obviously need something more than just the peace sign or peace rallies. We need the God of peace. And so let's read about him in Judges this morning, chapter 6. Judges, chapter 6, we get introduced to the God of peace. Chapter 6 in the book of Judges, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. Also Amalekites, people of the east, would come up against them. 
They would take all of their stuff, verse 5. They would come up with livestock and their tents, coming as numerous as the locusts, both they and their camels without numbers, and they would enter the land to destroy it. Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and they cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass, when they cried out to the Lord, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt. I brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you. I gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a tree which belonged to Joash, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where, where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us? Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Quite an interesting faith-filled response from Gideon. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the land of the Midian, hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? He said, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. The Lord said, surely I will be with you. You will defeat the Midianites as one man. Gideon says, well, let me offer a sacrifice. And he makes a sacrifice. Verse 20, the angel of the Lord said, take the meat and the unleavened bread. Lay them on the rock. Pour out the broth. He did so. The angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand, touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock, consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, and Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord. He called it the Lord Shalom. To this day, it sits in Ophrah in Abezerah. The Lord is my peace. So he has, Gideon has this experience with God. And at the time, Israel was in rebellion. They, as a result of their rebellion, they had fallen away from God. God sent in oppressors, the Midianites. They were oppressed for seven years. After seven years of oppression, they finally call out to God. God sends a prophet and says, the reason you're having this trouble is because you've forsaken me. I gave you this land. I told you to follow my ways and you've forsaken me. And now I've sent in the Midianites to punish you. And so then they repent. God raises up a a leader. In this case, it's Gideon. They turn their hearts back to God and they begin to have peace again. This cycle that you see, that you read about here, is a cycle that's found all the way through the book of Judges. About seven different times you see this cycle happening. They have peace, they get lazy, they start testing and checking out other gods, they start falling away from God. As a result of their falling away and their sin, God brings in enemies to to punish them. They get tired of the punishment after a certain period of time. They cry out to God. God raises up a prophet and a judge. They straighten up. They repent of their sins. The judge brings them peace by deliverance, and they start having peace again. This is a constant cycle that they go through. And here we find Gideon. He's threshing wheat in the wine press. The reason we're reading this is because the Midianites took all of their crops. Every time it was harvest time, Midianites would come in, take all their crops. So Gideon, he's so brave and smart, he decides he's going to thresh his wheat in the wine press so the Midianites can't steal it. Now, I'm not an expert on horticulture and agriculture and farming, but I do know this. You don't thresh wheat in the wine press. Why would he be doing something like that? He's hiding. He's hiding. You you have a wine press to crush the grapes. It's a big vat. When you're threshing wheat, you generally do it up on a hill. It was an old way of sorting the chaff from the wheat. You throw it up in the air. The wind blows away the chaff. You end up with all the wheat. Well, he's not going to do it up on the mountain because the Midianites will see him. So he's hiding in a wine press. 
And he's like all the rest of the Israelites wondering, what is up? Why, why is this misery coming upon us? An angel comes to him and says, hey, Gideon, God wants to use you to bring about deliverance. And Gideon's first response is, no, not me. You mean someone else. I think it's probably a pretty common response for most people. He's the least likely person to be chosen to be the leader for God to bring deliverance. But I tell you, that's a pattern God follows all the way through the scriptures. He picks people that are generally least likely. But he has this experience with him, and the angel uh, consumes the sacrifice, and all of a sudden he gets this revelation. Wow, man, this is really God. God hasn't burnt me up. And he makes this altar, and he says, God is peace. What an interesting thing. God is peace. The Lord, shalom, Jehovah, shalom. When he, when he says this, he's talking about something more than just not having war. I think sometimes people would think if we just wouldn't have war, there would be peace on earth. But, but it's a deeper peace than that. Shalom, the word shalom is a, is a Hebrew word. And when it's used, it has a lot of different meanings. It means well-being. It means health. It means a, a state of prospering. Uh, when the Jewish people greet each other, quite often they'll say shalom. They mean, you know, your house be blessed. May you be healthy. May you be in prosperity. And so here the, the peace he's talking about is more of an internal peace so that there's a lack of war going on inside which is what James wrote about in his epistle in the New Testament. He said, you know, where do wars come from? And we have a tendency to say from all the bad people out there and all the, you know, all the trouble, but James says wars come from within. This peace that, that Gideon is getting this revelation, God wants peace. When, when we begin to understand these character traits of God, it's the same kind of thing we talked about when, when we read about Jehovah Rapha, God is your healer. It's a foundational character trait of God. Regardless of what happens around you, God wants peace. God wants peace. And actually, there's a, a new, it's, you, this word peace is found 400, almost 400 times in the, in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. The uh, Greek word for peace is really a cool word. It's uh, the English where we would get the word Irene. And it means harmony sort of a musical term so it's like when you have three notes in a chord all three notes harmonize and so when it's used in the New Testament peace it means harmony means getting along so peace has uh, as its undertone relationship and it starts with the God of peace and so what what we're what we're trying to get an understanding of is that God is peace if we want peace we have to connect with him he's at peace He's at peace with himself. He's healthy. He, he needs nothing. He lacks nothing. He's inviting us to participate in his peace. But the problem is that peace has been broken. It was broken uh, when Adam and Eve sinned. We had peace at one time with God in the garden, but sin drove us from the presence of God. And ever since then, we have God pursuing us, trying to say, let's make peace. Let's get along. I mean, he's the pursuer. He is peace. He's trying to develop relationships. And until we have that relationship with God, there is not going to be any peace. There'll, there'll never be harmony within our own soul. We'll be at discord and we'll be anxious and dealing with stress and, and all kinds of things. But God is the God of peace. But if we want to participate in his peace, we have to abide by his rules, his regulations. He has rules. He has plans. It's not a free-for-all. We, we cannot experience the peace of God if we're doing the wrong thing. And this is what you read, chapter 6, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. They broke away from the ways of God. They disobeyed. And, and as a result, it says, And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. When peace is not in our lives, when we are struggling with difficulties, we need to understand quite often there is some bad behavior that's attributed to that. We have a tendency to say, it isn't my fault, it's circumstances. But here you clearly see they did evil in the sight of the Lord and there were consequences as a result. Difficulty came into their lives. Actually, 
this passage here in verse 6 is, is summarized in the end of the book of Judges. In the end of the book of Judges, it just summarizes the entire book. And it just says, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. They just forsook God. It sounds sort of similar to what's going on today. Everybody's making up their own rules. Everybody decides, well, that may be right for you, but that's not right for me. And, and maybe that's right for me, but it's not right for you. I wouldn't want to push my ideas on you. And, and there's no standard. Everybody do what they want. But, but if we want the peace of God, who is the God of peace, who wants peace in our lives, we have to do it his way. And when you break the laws of God and you do evil and, you res and the result of it is lack of peace, stress, discord, depression, all sorts of things, it might be wise to say, maybe this just isn't circumstance. Maybe this just isn't coincidence. Is there something I'm doing wrong? Is it possible that I'm reaping the fruit of my bad behavior? And the answer is quite often, yes. Not always, but it's at least worth opening your heart up to consider. And rather than open their hearts up, you see what they do. It says in verse 2, The hand of the Midianites prevail against them because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. Rather than repent for doing evil, they hide in the mountains. I mean, what, where's the wisdom of that? It's sort of like putting your head in the sand. They're hoping if they hide long enough, maybe the Midianites will leave them alone. It's running from the problem. It's not facing the problem. The problem was they were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And it took seven years of this kind of bad behavior before they broke and said, wow, maybe we should cry out to God which is what you find them doing. Then they cried out to God, and God began to you know, bring them the prophet in verse 8. Verse uh, 7, and, the, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet. It took them seven years of trying to avoid the issue, hoping it would go away. But folks, this happens still today. This is, this is the, the, the cycle of judges is the cycle of many, many people's lives. Good times and then falling away from God. Difficulty and then maybe and hopefully a spiritual awakening and then back into the good times that God has ordained. The peace that he has provided is available to everyone if we abide by his ways. But if we try to get around it, if we try to avoid it, if we try to hide in the caves and the strongholds, it isn't going to go away. You know, what, what, what's taking your peace away today? What, what, is, what is stealing your joy? What's causing stress in your life? Is it is, you have a boss who's not treating you right? You have discord in the home. Of course, it's your spouse. Or you don't have enough money. If you just have, you know, we, we think it's always somebody else. It's always somebody else. And so if it's the boss, we think, hey, I'll just get another job. And so I quit and get another job. Oh my gosh, isn't it interesting? Same problems follow. It's my spouse, so I'll dump her or dump him and I'll find another. And oh, wow, how did I end up in the second one just like the first one? It's money. If I only had more money, if I could make more money, if I'll go get a part-time job and you make more money and you get the raise and, oh my gosh, it's, I'm still broke. I mean, what's the problem? The problem sometimes isn't your boss. Maybe it's you. The problem maybe isn't your spouse. Maybe it's you. The problem isn't you don't have enough money. Maybe you're not handling it correctly. Maybe you're not honoring God with the tithe. Maybe there's a covetous attitude. But until we break, until we, we're tired of the lack of peace in our lives, it's not going to be for us. It is God's will. He is the God of peace. He created us to have peace with him. It's his passion. It's who he is. He sent his son into the world to secure this peace, to, to seal it. The New Testament tells us Jesus is our peace. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus talked about this peace. He said, my peace, this is the peace of God, I give to you. Not as the world gives, but I give you a different kind of peace. It's supernatural peace. 
It's internal peace. It, it makes you complete. But it comes when we abide by the will of God. And if we do evil and we try to fix it, it will never happen. We're breaking the laws of God. There's going to be conflict. Here's the, here's the conclusion to that. Spiritual problems cannot be solved by worldly methods. If the problem has a spiritual cause, it can only be solved by spiritually dealing with it. And what that means is you cry out to God. When you're tired of that frustration that's in your life, year after year, and I, I just think, man, what, what better time? Here we are entering a new year. Is there something that's nagging at you that has been nagging at you forever? You know, don't hide in the cave. Don't, don't ignore it. Don't run from it. Call upon God. He's very quick here. They cry out to the Lord right there. Verse 8, God sends a prophet. Okay, here's the issue. Here's what you need to do. Let's get going. I'm the God of peace. I'll bring peace in your life. Follow my ways. I'm going to close with a passage in the New Testament. Paul talks about how powerful this peace is. It's found in Philippians. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 4. Because again, it's not just peace. It's God's peace. It's not just lack of war. It doesn't, it's more than just we're not arguing anymore. It's internal completeness. It's well-being. It's a sense of fulfillment. Paul talks about this in chapter 4 of Philippians, verse 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Paul says, look, if you turn your heart towards God, and you surrender your life to God. God is going to give you his peace. But he says, this is, some, this is powerful peace. It's so powerful, it will guard your heart. Well, what does a guard do? When you think of a guard, like, you know, and, well, what do guards do? They're protecting the entrance of, you know, they're protecting so that the enemy doesn't get in. The peace of God protects your heart so that as we live in a world where there are no guarantees, we're not guaranteed that everything is going to work smooth in our life. We're not guaranteed that we're never going to be challenged or have difficulty. Jesus said we would. He said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We're going to face difficult times because we are living in a broken world. But Paul is saying, if you turn your life to God, you're going to have this peace of God which will guard your heart. It means you can have peace in the midst of some of the most incredible challenges and difficulties. You can have, I believe this peace is available to everyone who follows God, and I believe it's available 24-7 in the good times and in the bad times. And I believe, just as he's saying, it surpasses your understanding. It means that it's supernatural. You, you can't explain it. It's just you know you're at peace with God. And when you are at peace with God, whatever comes your way, you still have that peace. You don't give it up. You don't give in to stress and depression and, and, and all kinds of other things. You have the peace of God guarding your heart. So in summary, here's how I summarize it. I'm sure you've seen this. No God, no peace. No God, no peace. It's pretty simple. Pretty simple. God is a God of peace. It's who he is. He wants to give it to us. He wants us to share in this kind of shalom, which is a wholeness, a well-being, a sense of prospering and satisfaction. It comes from relationship with him. But if sin breaks our relationship with him and we start finding ourselves in stressful situations and difficult and frustration and arguing and unhappiness and misery and depression... Rather than ignore it, turn your heart towards God. Ask of God, what, what's going on here? And I promise you, he's quick to reveal it. Here's what's happening. Then you change, and you'll begin to experience that peace that passes understanding. It will guard your heart all your days. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are the God of peace. Wow, we, everyone hungers for peace. You, you put something inside of us that just craves peace. We want peace in our home. 
We want peace in our city. We want peace in our country. We want peace in the world. We want peace with you, God. I thank you, God, because you want peace. You more, more than that, you are peace. It's your character. You are at peace. And you want us to join in it, God. And I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, as we enter a new year, Father, that, that we would believe you want peace in our lives. Whatever it is that we may be facing, God, that we would open our hearts to you and allow you to bring about that reconciliation, to make things right, God. We want that peace, God, that guards our hearts and that passes understanding, God, that we can have it in the morning as we get up throughout the day and at night when we lay down, God, a peace which passes all understanding. We thank you, Father. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we all stand? We're going to take our offering at this time. stay in the presence of the Lord here. And I truly sensed as I was preaching this morning that the Holy Spirit of God was touching some of you in your, in your inner man, in your soul. You, you felt something this morning. It was more than just words that, that was happening there. It was the Holy Spirit of God. And you know, I just sensed there's some people here this morning that maybe you're getting the realization my life's not working out because I haven't really made this connection with God. Or maybe you made that connection with God, but it was years ago and you've now seen, you've been in this cycle like the children of Israel. But I just sense this morning, the Holy Spirit of God wants me to tell you, God is a God of do-overs. He never gets tired of saying yes to you when you say, Father, forgive me. He's always ready. But I, I just sense this morning the Holy Spirit of God is calling some of you to make a decision. Do you, do you want to make a change this morning? You want to surrender your life? You want to turn things over? It's a decision only you can make. No one can make it for you. I just want to take a moment and pray. And, and if you're feeling that tug at your heart, I'm, I'm just going to ask you if you just raise your hand right where you're standing just to let me know where you're at. And we'll just pray a blessing over you. And, and after the service, we'd love for you to come forward so we can talk with you. But I just really sense the Holy Spirit of God speaking to some of you today. It's time to break out of the cycle. It's time to experience the, the peace that God is offering you. So, Father, I, I just welcome your presence here right now, God. And I, I know, Father, you're calling people to join up with you so that you can give them your peace. That their life can be blessed, prosper, health, well-being stability complete all that shalom has to offer God you're offering it this morning but it does start with that connection with you we can't do it on our own God just come Holy Spirit knock at the door of hearts awaken that that hunger that's there God just come Holy Spirit if you're feeling that tug at your heart, would you just let me know where you're at? Just, just raise your hand. Say, yeah, Pastor Dave, I want to I wanna make a decision this morning. I want to break out of that cycle. Just raise your hand. All the way in the back, I see one hand. Anybody else this morning? I want to break out of that cycle. I want to commit my life to Christ. I want the God of peace in my life instead of the stuff I've been experiencing. Anybody else this morning? I want to make a decision. I want to turn things around. Just raise your hand. Let me know where you're at. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Anybody else? Oh, I got a sister in the back here. If you just, church, join with me. Let's just pray a simple prayer. We're going to ask Jesus to come in and reestablish that peace give you the peace that he's offered so repeat after me Jesus please come into my life right now I'm sorry for my sins 
please forgive me. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to bring me and give me that peace. Just come, Holy Spirit. Just, I want to pray in Jesus' name. I pray shalom over you, sister. The peace of God that passes understanding. Just fill her in Jesus' name. I just bless her. We have a prayer team up front here. I just got this other word as I was praying this morning that that some of you have been praying about habits that are just bothering you. You just can't seem to break out of them. And, you know, there's certain ones that we, you know, some of us have, have dealt with and maybe have gotten victory, maybe have fallen back. But, but anyway, I just sense this morning, God wants to uh, give you the hope you can break out of these habits. They don't have to control you. They don't have to control you. If you find yourself again and again, you don't want to give up. And I just sense this morning, if, you're, if you've been praying about breaking out of some habit, I, I just believe the Holy Spirit wants to confirm that and seal that. And if you would like prayer for that this morning, we'll be up front here. We'll be glad to pray for you. If you have other situations you're dealing with, maybe you have some questions about uh, what I was talking about this morning, connecting with God, we'd love to talk with you. So after the service, we invite you to come forward. Love to pray with you. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for bringing us together this morning, and I pray, God, as we go out this week and as we wish people Happy New Year, and as we think about the beginning of a new year, God, I just pray you drop something into our spirit, something you want us to look at this year, to work on, that, that we could find our lives getting more in line with you and your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're all dismissed.